Welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show, your resource for bone health, hormone optimization, and health span. So Prolia, or denosumab, is a popular drug choice for treatment of osteoporosis by a lot of doctors. I've recorded on Prolia in the past, but we've gotten so many questions and comments, particularly in YouTube, on our health span nation, and from our patients, about the risk of fracture after stopping the drug. So I want to dig into the, the research behind this. I'm going to present some of the same research I've presented before, but really focus more on the what happens when you stop the drug and what is your risk of fracture? Because I see this really provoking a lot of fear in a lot of people. So walk with me as I go through these risks, how I see it, what we're doing about it, what we're doing with our full service patients, uh, and how we are handling this for the most part without additional pharmaceuticals. Also, if you find this content valuable, click that subscribe button for me. The more people that subscribe, the more people we can help. Three, two, one. Okay, so Prolia, if you haven't heard of it, was approved for use by the FDA for osteoporosis in 2010. It is a relatively convenient drug delivered as a sub-Q injection every six months. It is a what's called a monoclonal antibody, it means it works against, work, kind of uses the immune system to find a thing and work against it. It binds against this thing called the rank ligand. The rank ligand is part of the process of formation and function and survival of osteoclasts. So if you can deactivate rank ligand, it will have a significant impact on osteoclasts and potentially some other things. But it definitely reduces bone resorption by osteoclasts. And the studies that I'm going to talk about will demonstrate that it does this very effectively. But like other anti-resorptive drugs, it also reduces bone building. Um, so we can see big reductions of CTX, which you've heard me talk about before, which is the bone breakdown marker. That's what you would expect to see. But because CTX and P1 and P, which is the bone building marker, are linked, when you drop CTX to the floor, P1 and P goes down too. And the studies actually show that really clearly. And I see that in my patients as well. So at first glance, that kind of seems awesome. You just do a little injection once every six months and your bone mineral density gets better and your risk of fracture goes down. Two thumbs up, right? maybe. Let's look at the studies. Let's talk about the risks, particularly with the risk of what happens when you stop the drug. So let's start with this uh, study from 2010. So the FREEDOM trial, and FREEDOM stands for Fracture Reduction Evaluation of Denosumab and Osteoporosis Every Six Months uh, trial. That's a great name, by the way. So whoever came up with that acronym, uh, that was amazing. But this was a big study. It was funded by Amgen, uh, the manufacturer of the drug. So this is a, an industry-funded study that was used in the phase three trials to get FDA approval. So take that for what it is. This study enrolled 7,868 women aged 60 to 90 years old with osteoporosis. They could not have a T-score lower than negative four um, in the lumbar spine and the total hip. Um, so it didn't have any real severe cases, although you know negative four is pretty bad. Uh, and then they were randomized to receive either the drug or placebo, and they did this every six months for a total of 36 months. The primary endpoint was new vertebral fractures, with secondary endpoints being non-vertebral fractures specifically uh, uh, and hip fractures, so kind of two different groups there. And then all participants, whether placebo or um, on the drug uh, intervention side, all had um, uh, vitamin D and calcium supplied as well. They didn't specify as to how much. So from a results perspective, what they reported was a 68% reduction in vertebral fractures. Sounds pretty good. However, they go on to report that there was an actual reduction of 4.9%. Now, they didn't actually say that. You have to do the math. But they show that there was a difference between 7.2% and 2.3%, which is 4.9%. That's the absolute reduction of fracture in the uh, intervention group versus the placebo group. It's still not small. Almost 5% is not bad. And then from a hip fracture perspective, they said relative risk of 40% and non-vertebral fracture by 20% relative to placebo. But again, that's relative risk. If you look at absolute reduction for the hip fracture, it's a 0.5% hip fracture reduction. So it's really not actually very beneficial for hips. 
Bone mineral density also went up as well, as you would anticipate. It went up by 9.2% at the lumbar spine, 6% at the total hip as compared to placebo. And this is really interesting. The CTX went down by 86%. That's a big reduction. But P1 and P went down by 76%. So remember what I said, CTX, P1 and P, they're linked. If one drops, so does the other. And that's my experience with these drugs and the challenge that we have with these drugs over time, which is if you drop P1 and P to the floor, you're not building bone. You can't go forever without building bone. You have to have bone metabolism. So you can't tank them both forever. It's going to lead to issues, as we'll see. The study talks about side effects. They don't really report many, which I think is kind of interesting compared to what I hear about patients uh, when they start these drugs. So they discuss eczema. They discuss flatulence, which I think is a weird side effect for a sub-Q drug. Um, and they also talk about cellulitis that was statistically significant. So when you hear about eczema and cellulitis, you might be thinking, well, that's weird. How does that happen? So you might be wondering how that's possible that we could get these weird kind of like immune things, uh, increased risk of infection. But remember how I talked about rank ligand. Rank ligand, which is the target of the antibody that the drug is, uh, rank ligand is also associated with other things that come from that same uh, stem cell lineage. So osteoclasts come from uh, an immune system stem cell. That stem cell also can become macrophages, which is one of the cells of the immune system. And if you mess with rank ligand, you're going to mess with macrophages and that can increase your risk of infection. So we do see that clearly. And I already mentioned uh, that this study was funded by Amgen and it was part of the clinical trials. So there is potentially some bias there, although there's not supposed to be. All right, so let's move on to the updated data now that we have uh, reviewed kind of the historic stuff. Before we do that, if you're struggling to put together your own program for uh, bone health and improving your bone health over time, consider our free masterclass. The masterclass is where we put together the way that we're managing our bone health patients with all of the potential tools. It's a 60 minute class. We spend about 45 minutes going through the program and then we spend about 15 minutes answering questions. So if you haven't gone through that and you have osteoporosis, I strongly encourage you to do it to get more tools that you can stick in your tool belt to help improve your bone health. All right. So where are we getting all of this fear around stopping prolia? We didn't hear it in that first study, right? Well, those were people that had been on it for three years. Nobody had stopped it yet. So they were following people for three years uh, and then they were reporting on the data. Now, there is a 2017 publication looking at 10-year data. So now we have the extension from the Freedom Trial. So this is a seven-year extension. And what they did is they took people that were in the trial on the drug and they offered for them to continue on the drug for another seven years. And then they took people that were on the placebo and said, hey, by the way, you're on the placebo. If you wanna be on the drug, you can be a part of this. Uh, trial and you can be on this for the next seven years. So a lot of people did that. And so what they were looking for specifically in this study was safety. They're looking for um, adverse events, serious adverse events, uh, basically anything that would discourage people from continuing to take this drug over time. Secondary outcomes from this trial were fractures. So new vertebral hip, non-vertebral fractures, and also looking at bone mineral density. So this next part's kind of interesting. So when you look at the methodology, they enrolled, uh, let's see here. Yeah, they enrolled 4,550, so 2,343 from the um, intervention group before, and 2,207 that crossed over from being on the placebo group. So that was a total of, gosh, 4,500 something, right? So that's a lot of people. Only 2,626 actually completed the seven-year extension. They don't really talk much about that in the study. Kind of makes you wonder why. Um, and when they looked at uh, adverse events over 10 years, there was 11.5 and 14.4 adverse events per 100 participant years. It's kind of how they do it. They don't do it in, in percentages. And then they talk about, you know, what kind of adverse events. Now, in the initial study, they did not, they claimed that there were no atypical femur fractures. There were no cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw. So, I mean, might be true. It takes time for these things to happen. But now in this longer study, we do start to see them. So they report one atypical femur fracture, seven cases of osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, but again, we don't know what happened to those other 2,000 some odd people. Uh, maybe they had something and it wasn't reported because they didn't finish their uh, study. They also reported on bone mineral density. It continued to go up by a fair amount, actually, 21.7% at the spine, which is pretty remarkable, 9.2% of the total hip. So, okay, yes, it does continue to, to work. And that was kind of it, you know? And so now we have this 10-year data and everything looks good and you can take this drug forever. Not quite. So 
there was another study looking at the people that discontinued Prolio. So now we're going to go back and, and this was actually also funded by Amgen, but now we're going to go back and we're going to look at people that stopped the drug. And here's, this is where things kind of like ran off the, the, the tracks. So this third study investigated the effects of discontinuing the drug and looking at that group that discontinued versus those that were on placebo and then didn't start on the drug. They looked at the risk of vertebral fractures and specifically multiple vertebral fractures. So this is kind of a big deal. So then what they did is, unlike the, the second study that I talked about, that 10-year follow-up, where they would have only reported on vertebral fractures if they were symptomatic, this study actually looked at x-rays and, again, of people that had discontinued the drug. So now we were looking at symptomatic, non-symptomatic, and people that had discontinued the drug, and they divided them out for the people that had been on it for three years and then stopped versus people that had been on it for over three years um, and then stopped. The previous study, like I said, didn't use x-ray, so they were picking up more fractures here. I think they would have picked up even more fractures if they would have used um, uh, MRI, uh, which they didn't do. Would have been a very expensive study if they did. All right, so then they included 327 people who had discontinued the placebo and 475 who had discontinued the drug. And then they divided those that discontinued the drug from those that were less than three years and those that were greater than three years. And that was almost even, actually. So it is kind of interesting to, that that's a pretty small number compared to the number of people that actually started the, the trial, right? So we mentioned there were 4,500 people that started, like 2,000, a little over 2,000, 2,200, something like that, that finished the trial. And now we're down to 327 and 475. So I always wonder, you know, what happened to the other people? Um, and these are just the people that we had x-rays on, that's why. But still, I'd love to see x-rays or MRI on all of them to know what happened. So this is what they said. The crude incidence of vertebral fracture and multiple vertebral fracture was higher after discontinuing the drug compared to placebo. The proportion of women developing multiple vertebral fracture was significantly higher in those discontinuing the drug. Hmm. So they reported this in percentages per 100 patient years. So it's, it's not exactly like this percentage is what you're going to see per person but it's per 100 patient years. And so what they say is that for any vertebral fracture, the crude incidence was 9.5% after placebo, which is, I still think, pretty high, and 11.8% after discontinuation of the drug. So it's really not that big of a difference, but it's there. Uh, for multiple vertebral fracture, the crude incidence was 37 after placebo and 72 after the drug. That is a bigger difference. The proportion of total vertebral fracture that was multiple vertebral fracture was higher after the drug 61% compared to the proportion observed after stopping the placebo, 39%. I'm reading this from the study because I don't want to get these numbers wrong. I'll explain it uh, in more simple terms in a second. They go on to say that the incidence of women with greater than four vertebral fractures was 0.6% after placebo and 2.7% after the drug. So then they go on to talk about the difference between the short versus the long group. So the longer you were on the drug, the higher your rebound turnover was, the greater the bone loss, and the higher incidence of multiple vertebral fractures. For those that had a presence of greater than four vertebral fractures, this was primarily observed in women treated with the drug for more than three years. So there was more risk the longer that you were treated with the drug. So what the heck does all that mean? And I apologize again for having to read that, but I wanted to make sure I get those numbers correct. I don't want to be said that I'm lying around these data. So... Um, that's concerning, right? And this is what freaks people out. There's so much fear around this. And I get women that will learn about this after they take their first injection, right? They go to the doctor, they're like, oh, you should take this drug. Here it is. And they do the injection and then they go home and they read about it and they're freaking out. And they're in our YouTube comments and they're just like at their wits end because they think that they're gonna have a fracture. That's not really how it works. If you look at the, this study very clearly, they say that if you were on it for less than three years, there was no increased risk if you came off of it compared to placebo. So you have time. Now, if you're after that three-year mark, there is some increased risk, but again, it's still not a massive increase in risk. Does it increase your risk? Absolutely, but it's not a huge increase in risk. Single digits, in fact, low single digits. Is that something worth watching? Absolutely. So a lot of traditional doctors, if you're gonna come off of Prolia, will then switch you to another drug. Could be a bisphosphonate more anti-resorption, potentially could be an anabolic if they want to build up bone loss. There's some different theories and philosophies there. 
Um, in my opinion, I don't think that we need more suppression of bone building after prolia. That would be a bisphosphonate. That's not what I would recommend doing. Um, anabolic would be my preference if we're going to do anything. But what do we do? Well, the first thing I do is reassure patients because, again, they're freaking out. They're really worried about fracture. They really regret their decision to make that uh, drug choice, uh, assuming that they had anything to do with the decision making in the first place. So remember that in these trials on the drugs, the participants are really not doing much else for their bones, right? Maybe some calcium and vitamin D. But if you're part of this community, if you're watching this video, you are acting, you are doing stuff for your bones. If you're following any of these videos and you're talking to other people, getting recommendations, you are lifting, you are doing impact, you are working on your diet, you're doing all the things, you're kicking ass, you are improving your bones. You are not like most of the people in these studies. Maybe you're part of our health span nation. Maybe you're uplifting each other in our community. Maybe you're part of our full service program. Maybe we're doing all the things, right? You don't see in these studies where they kind of break down all those different variables. And let's face it, most people aren't doing these things. I wish they would. Um, if you're doing this, if you're watching this, you're really working on your lifestyle. You're nailing all of these things that we talk about in these videos. You are probably nailing your supplements. There's a good chance that you're on hormone replacement, right? You're doing all the things. That is not the same group that is in this study. It's not the same group that saw multiple vertebral fractures. Probably. I can't say that for sure. So when patients come in to us, they're on Prolia. They want to come off of it. And let's face it, you have to come off of it at some point, right? We only have safety data to 10 years. We can't block bone resorption forever. So you have to come off of it at some point. And when you do, you need to have a solid plan. Will they fracture? Maybe. I'm not in a guarantee kind of business. The human body doesn't work that way. But the, what we recommend is we have a conversation around what was your bone quality like to start with? What's your fracture risk? Have you had fractures before? Because most of the people with multiple vertebral fractures in the study had already had fractures before. So they had pretty bad bone quality to begin with. And then we monitor them closely. So regardless of who you're working with, if you're getting bone turnover markers and you're coming off prolia, talk to your doctor about getting them more frequently. How frequently? That's kind of up to you and your provider. We're going to do it at least probably every six weeks to three months in the first six months as they're coming off of prolia because we want to know what's happening. Are we able to kind of blunt the increase in CTX? Because we know we're going to see it. But is it going to go through the roof? Is it going to go over 1,000? Or are we going to see it rise, you know, 50%, 100%? But remember, it was really suppressed to begin with. So I'm okay with that, actually. I just don't want to watch it go crazy, right? I don't want to see them resorb all the bone that they just built up over the last however many years. We make sure that they're receiving the support that they need. We're monitoring them very closely. And remember that there are drug options if needed. If we need to potentially add an anti-resorptive, we could. Or if they're just having a hard time building bone and their P1 and P isn't going up with their CTX, we could potentially add an anabolic, even if for a relatively short period of time. And so there's just so many ways to do it. But what you have to do is to be active. You have to be proactive. Um, you have to be very intentional as you come off of a drug like Prolia because there is increased risk. But being paralyzed by fear is not the answer either. It's just having a plan. Okay, so this was uh, an updated review of Prolia. And if you like this, please consider the videos, the worst drug for osteoporosis, which is my description of bisphosphonates. You can tell what my opinion is there. And then we also have another video called the best drugs for osteoporosis or a pathway to cancer. And that's my discussion around Forteo and Temlos, the anabolic drugs uh, that I just mentioned a little bit ago. So that's it. Remember, my friends, you are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Don't be afraid to be extraordinary because you are, and that's what it takes. I'll see you in the next video. This presentation is for general informational purposes only, does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this presentation are at the user's own risk. The content in this presentation is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay obtaining medical advice for any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions.